Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along uh, to this uh, interesting presentation. Before we present some insights into our Northern Australia's um, hidden uh, groundwater resources, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country where this work has been undertaken. We would like to also acknowledge the support provided by individuals and communities to access the land, mainly in the arid and remote and rural part of Australia. When I look at this um, picture, I was thinking of uh, Dorothy McKellar, who has nicely described the Australian landscape in her poem, My Country. She said, allow my sunburned country, a land of sweeping plains, of course, of ragged mountain ranges, and also droughts and flooding rains. Those words remain true, if not truer today, as they were in 1904. As we have seen more extreme temperatures and more severe floods and droughts in this country. With that, Australia continuing to be the driest inhabitant continent, which makes water use and management a key national challenge. In this presentation, we would like to cover, myself and my colleagues will like to cover a range of topics as outlined in this year. First, let us look at the water availability. When you look at the, the picture on the left-hand slide, it clearly shows that the fresh water represent less than 3% of total available water globally. And then when you look at it, you may think surface water is more abundant than other groundwater and other things. However, when we look at on the picture on the right hand side, it clearly shows that um, groundwater is 100 times bigger than uh, surface water. Well, we need to understand our reliance on groundwater in Australia. It represents uh, over 30% of Australia's water comes from uh, groundwater, and it generates 6.8 billion economic activity annually, and it is an essential resource for vast majority of water used in Northern Australia, as you can see on the map on the left-hand side. Um, the one uh, on the map on the left-hand side is clearly showing that the pink areas of this map, that's where the areas of the country with depending more on groundwater. Of course, when you look at the, the groundwater, uh, it supports uh, different industries such as agriculture, mining, and energy, and also supports towns and individual farms, and also sustaining our natural environment. Our reliance on groundwater is likely to increase with the population increase, as well as climate change and the expansion in the north. So it is important to understand these resources for sustainably managing these resources in Australia. Exploring for the future was a 100.5 million four-year Australian government funded initiative that has been completed on the 30th of June, 2020. It provided a holistic picture of the potential mineral energy 
and groundwater resources in Northern Australia. The program has delivered new geoscience data, knowledge, and tools to support increased industry investment and economic development across the North. The groundwater component of the EFDA program focused on addressing groundwater resource knowledge gaps to support future opportunities for economic development or for community water supplies. Geoscience Australia was really fortunate to have a valuable state and territory partners through which this groundwater program undertook targeted regional investigations of groundwater systems across the six regions, as you can see in this map. Uh, the work has been uh, undertaken. The program activities involved application of um, geoscience tools to collect, integrate, and analyze a range of data. It includes geological and hydrogeological data, airborne and ground geophysical and hydrogeochemical surveys, including satellite data and drilling. So better understanding and sustainably using groundwater resources for social, economic, and environmental benefits requires quality data on the tools. For the remainder of this presentation, my colleagues and myself, my colleagues will share examples of how exploring for the future groundwater program has contributed towards the themes of groundwater for communities, groundwater for economic development, and groundwater for the environment. Now I will hand over it to my colleague, Stephen Hostler, who will provide some insights into the theme of groundwater supporting communities. Hi, my name is Steve. I'm a hydrogeologist here at Geoscience Australia. And whether it's a house bore or a reticulated town supply, millions of Australians rely on groundwater for our communities and our homes. Across Northern Australia, most towns rely on groundwater as their sole source of water, or at least as a backup water supply. It really is the lifeblood of many towns, keeping lawns green, cooling homes, and of course, providing safe, clean water to drink. During the Exploring for the Future program, and in partnership with our state and territory colleagues, many of our regional projects directly helped to support communities secure reliable supplies of water. From understanding the risk of groundwater supplies in Howard East near Darwin, to protecting dry season water supplies in the Upper Burdekin in Queensland that supplies Charters Towers, to working with the Power and Water Corporation to supply and help remote communities, we've directly helped towns right across the Northern Australia. There's too much content for us to look at all the work we've done, but we can take a closer look at one of our key projects in Alice Springs. Alice Springs is the largest town in Central Australia with a population of over 26,000 people. The Aranta people have lived in the region for time immemorial, while European settlement started in the 1870s as part of the Overland Telegraph system. The town receives more than 400,000 visitors each year who come to enjoy the timeless culture and the beautiful desert landscape. Alice Springs is also an economic powerhouse in the region contributing over $2.8 billion each year to the Australian economy. Not surprisingly, Alice Springs climate is designated as arid desert, which means that evaporation far exceeds rainfall. Average annual rainfall is about 280 millimeters a year, 
but it can is highly variable. It can range from about 60 millimeters a year in 1928 to over 780 in 1974. The community is located within the McDonald Ranges, with the eponymous springs being an ephemeral waterhole in the Cenozoic sediments. The normally dry Todd River flows through the town and then out through the heavy tree gap and into the Amadeus Basin. Modern groundwater extraction started in the 1960s in Row Creek Boarfield, south of the town. Extraction of water is mainly from aquifers within the Amadeus Basin and to a much lesser extent from other aquifers in the inner and outer farm basins. The major aquifers within the Amadeus Basins are the Marini and Pukuta sandstones. And the geology of the Amadeus is very complex. For example, in the vicinity of the Row Creek Boarfield, the aquifers dip at 30 degrees to the south. What this means is that every, for every kilometer you move to the south, the aquifer is 500 meters deeper, which of course means it's much more expensive to both drill and to operate a borefield. Total groundwater use in Alice Springs is over 10 billion liters of water a year, or about 1,000 liters per person per day. And because of the relatively low rate of groundwater recharge in Alice Springs, the Northern Territory government made a management decision to mine the groundwater supplies in the Amadeus Basin. The current plan is to limit extraction to a quarter of total groundwater storage in the basin over the next 100 years. To help manage this water supply, what we need is data. And while any one geologic data set can help us understand groundwater resources, it is the power of combining multidisciplinary data sets that makes Geoscience Australia and the Exploring for the Future program unique. For example, in Alice Springs, we flew over 2,500 line kilometers of airborne electromagnetics, or AEM. And this helps us to understand both the geology and the groundwater properties of the area. We took 34 ground magnetic resonance soundings, which helps us understand the nature of the aquifer. We sampled 21 groundwater bores to find out water quality changes and how groundwater recharge occurs. We collected 19 downhole geophysical logs to help us calibrate the AEM, and we drilled three new bores and put in a number of groundwater level monitoring. Using all this data combined allows us to map the geology and the aquifers in three dimensions in more detail than ever before. For example, at the bottom of the screen, you can see a sample of an interpreted AEM line. Its location on the 3D image above is shown in the heavy red line in the center of the figure. In the AEM line, areas of low conductivity are shown in blue, while areas of high conductivity are shown in red. AEM conductivity is complex, as it's affected by both geology and groundwater. For example, a low conductivity unit such as a sandstone will appear blue, as will fresh water. But it's by combining the AEM with the downhole geophysics, the ground magnetic resonance, and the groundwater sampling that we can understand what signals are due to geology and what signals are due to groundwater. Our scientists interpret these changes assigning geology in 2D slices. These individual slices are then combined to produce a 3D model as shown above. For example, you can see the shape and the structural controls of the Marini sandstone, which is the most important aquifer in the region, shown in the figure in the red-brown color. Understanding the shape and the volume of this aquifer will directly help water managers in Alice Springs understand how much water is available and what controls groundwater processes. Now, water managers are still working through the implications of our exploring for the future work and will be for many years. For example, when we combine the geologic model of the Alice Springs area with our understanding of groundwater processes, we can start to manage the resource better. For example, the age of groundwater, as shown by carbon-14, help us to understand where 
groundwater recharge occurs. The blue dots show bores with modern recharge, while the red dots show bores where groundwater is over 20,000 years old. In the recharge areas identified by the geologic model, we see younger water and therefore more groundwater recharge in key areas. And this information can form the basis of future groundwater models and potentially indicate areas where managed aquifer recharge could occur. Thanks to the Exploring for the Future program, the prospects for helping Alice Springs and other communities manage their water supplies for the long term have never looked better. And we've seen how groundwater supports communities. Now let's look at how groundwater supports economic development. Thank you, Stephen. My name is Donna Cathro, and I'm going to talk about groundwater for economic development in Australia's north. With a lack of significant surface water over much of northern Australia, economic expansion requires access to groundwater of suitable quality and quantity. The value of agricultural production in northern Australia was worth approximately $12.7 billion in 2017-18. However, the region has over 16 million hectares suitable for intensive agriculture waiting to be unlocked, limited only by water security. Groundwater is also vital to support minerals and energy development throughout Northern Australia. The new data and analyses pr products from uh, Geoscience Australia will substantially improve the management of untapped groundwater resources and fast track opportunities for large scale investments. As you can see in this map, many of the Exploring for the Future groundwater projects considered groundwater from an economic perspective. I will use the Western Davenport region to illustrate how the Exploring for the Future program has contributed towards understanding groundwater for economic development. The Western Davenport project area straddles, straddles the Wiseau and Georgina basins and covers an area of approximately 40 square kilometres. It is broadly defined by the Western Davenport Water Control District. The project area is about 150 kilometres south of Tennant Creek and 350 kilometres north of Alice Springs. Of the roughly 1,000 people in the area, half live in the Ali Karun community, with three smaller communities and nine homelands or family outstations also located within the Water Control District. Agriculture, primarily pastoral, is the main land use in, the West, in Western Davenport, with lesser amounts of horticulture. Tourism and some mining exploration constitute the non-agricultural economic operations in the area. The Western Davenport has been identified as an area for potential expansion of agricultural and horticultural development and mineral exploration. The Northern Territory Government recently developed the Western Davenport Water Allocation Plan to ensure equitable sharing of groundwater resources as interest in the area increases. Groundwater accounts for all consumptive water use in this study area. In collaboration with our Northern Territory partners, the main aims of the Western Davenport project are to improve the definition and architecture of the geology, including the development of a geological model as appropriate to understanding the groundwater resources undertake regular mapping to under, underpin assessment of managed aquifer recharge, or MAR targets, and improve the definition and characterisation of the hydrostratigraphy and hydrochemistry of the study area based on new data from the historic and newly drilled bores in the Wiso and Georgina basins. Common to all the Exploring for the Future groundwater projects is the integration of multiple data sets that together provide a more complete story of the geology and hydrogeology of a region, and the Western Davenport project is no exception. New data acquired in the Western Davenport study area include approximately 3,500 line kilometres of airborne electromagnetic or AEM data, over 1,500 metres of total drilling, resulting in 11 additional monitoring bores in the region, each fitted with data loggers to understand temporal changes in groundwater levels, and 17 new groundwater samples. These data were complemented by the acquisition of surface and downhole geophysics throughout the study area. All core and cutting samples were analysed using the high logger spectroscopic scanner to determine the mineralogy of the recovered material. The scanning was performed by the Southern Australia, South Australian Department of Envi Energy and Mining and the data will ultimately be available through the National Virtual Core Library. 
In the example shown here, the scanning results highlight the boundary between the primarily do dolomitic Hanson riverbeds and the quartz-dominated Lake Surprise Sandstone. These new data were interpreted in concert with the existing data to develop a three-dimensional geological model across the central part of the study area. Interpretation of airborne electromagnetic and borehole data has enabled a robust correlation to be made between the stratigraphic units in the Wiseau and Georgina basins in the investigation area as is illustrated by the three-dimensional model to the left. On the AEM cross-section, such as shown at the bottom of the slide, Paleo Valley sediments are distinguishable from the underlying bedrock succession. To the right is a water table map constructed from water level observations in new and existing bores and new surface nuclear magnetic resonance soundings. In general, the water depth, uh, the water depth table depth increases to the northwest. Hydrochemical results that contribute to understanding the groundwater characteristics in the Western Davenport are shown here with total dissolved solids to the right and chloride mass balance to the left. The total dissolved solids data shows the central zone of the Western Davenport area is characterised by good quality groundwater, with the newly drilled bores identified, identifying additional areas of low salinity groundwater. These initial hydrochemistry results suggest groundwater in the Western Davenport may support an expansion of irrigated agriculture. The chloride mass balance data, as measured at boreholes indicated by the red dots uh, in the figure on, uh, on the left, um, provides insight into recharge variability in the area. Recharge is an important factor to, in understanding the sustainability of groundwater resources, but is difficult to quantify, particularly in, in arid environments. Significant recharge areas in the study area are highly sporadic, only occurring every one to two decades following very large rainfall events. Thus, infrequent peak rainfall years contribute disproportionately to groundwater recharge, while in an average year, little, if any, groundwater recharge occurs. The hydrochemistry data has identified three zones of potentially higher recharge indicated by the yellows and reds. The first area is the flood out from, the Skinner, from Skinner Creek, possibly combined with mountain front recharge from the Davenport Ranges in the east of the area. Secondly, there are the localised flood outs of Taylor Creek to the west of Ali Kurung. And thirdly, along some ephemeral streams and localised creek flood outs along the Hanson River to the west of the study area and to the south of Ali Kurung. Groundwater stable isotope data suggests minimal evaporation of water prior to recharge and that groundwater recharge only occurs following heavy rainfall events. This preliminary inv information suggests recharge to, gr to groundwater is dominated by episodic recharge from floodouts and creeks rather than direct infiltration across the Western Davenport area from large rain uh, rainfall events. Given the aridity of the area and variable nature of recharge events, managed aquifer recharge provides a tool that could increase the security of groundwater resources in the area. The regolith mapping presented here can assist in better understanding the surface and near surface environments and their influence on hydrogeological processes. This provides a tool uh, with which to begin identifying potential areas for en enhancing natural recharge processes to supplement existing groundwater resources. Such areas are highlighted with a heavy black outline and in places correlate with zones prone to high soil mo moisture following large rainfall events, such as shown in the Sentinel data following a 200 millimetre rainfall event in 2017. This mapping was possible because of the increasing availability of higher resolution digital elevation, airborne radiometric and Landsat satellite remotely sensed data. The work described here, coupled with managed aquifer recharge mapping, undertaken as part of the Exploring for the Future program, provides new information to support groundwater management in the Western Davenport area. Now we move to how exploring for the future projects provide a greater understanding towards groundwater for the environment in Northern Australia, presented by my colleague, Laura Gow. As Donna said, my name is Laura Gow and I'm going to talk about groundwater for the environment in Northern Australia. Water that is allocated and managed specifically to improve the health of rivers, wetlands, springs and floodplains and associated water-dependent flora and fauna is known as water for the environment. 
These water bodies and ecosystems play a vital role in sustaining healthy communities and economies and have great cultural and spiritual significance to Aboriginal people. As you can see in this map, many of the Exploring for the Future groundwater projects consider groundwater for, from an environmental perspective. I will use the McBride and Nulla Basalt provinces to illustrate how the Exploring for the Future program has contributed towards understanding groundwater for the environment. The McBride and Nulla Basalt provinces are located to the northwest and southwest of Townsville in North Queensland, as shown in the map here. The hydrogeology of these two provinces was investigated as part of the Upper Burdekin groundwater project. These two basalt provinces were chosen due to their link with good agricultural soils and their groundwater resource potential. This study was a collaboration between Geoscience Australia and the Queensland Government. The aim of the project was to develop an understanding of the key groundwater system processes in each basalt province, information that will assist further development of the groundwater resource while minimising impact on existing values. One of the project objectives was to better understand the interactions between groundwater and surface water. In particular, how and where groundwater contributes to surface water flow, with a focus on the Burdekin River, and the role and characteristics of springs for providing base flow to rivers and creeks and supporting groundwater dependent ecosystems, commonly referred to as GDEs. The McBride and Nulla basalt provinces form relatively flat regions built up of multiple basalt flows that filled in stream channels and valleys and were later fractured and weathered. Numerous springs are known to occur throughout both provinces. Springs are dynamic systems and can be fed by groundwater through different pathways. While some springs are permanent, others can dry up as part of their natural behaviour. The management of springs is complex and relies on an understanding of changes in groundwater levels and their response to seasonal and long-term climate patterns. These springs are an important source of water for GDEs, pastoralists and graziers in the area, with many springs discharging to creeks and rivers that feed into the Burdekin River, providing an important source of river base flow during the dry season. A range of data were collected, analysed and interpreted to better understand the interactions between groundwater and surface water resources. This included stratigraphic drilling, groundwater level monitoring, surface and groundwater chemistry sampling and analysis, geological field observations, a LIDAR elevation survey, analysis of satellite imagery available from Geoscience Australia's Digital Earth Australia platform and much more. We found that for both provinces, satellite imagery analysis shown in the maps here supported the location of map springs, shown as white dots, and also identified additional discharge areas where either water, here as blue areas, or moisture, as pink and green areas, was found to remain in the landscape during the dry season. These areas may be either locations of groundwater discharge or shallow groundwater that may support a range of ecosystems in the area. During the dry season, groundwater discharge from the, basalt, the McBride Basalt Province, shown in the left-hand map, accounts for an estimated 60 to 90% in the Upper Burdekin River through a combination of spring-fed creeks and direct discharge from basalt aquifers. This is supported by the satellite imagery analysis, which shows the parts of the Burdekin River always contain water, as shown by the red circle. These flows provide a reliable source of base flow and enable the Burdekin River to flow all year round. In the Nullar Basalt province, shown in the right hand map, groundwater discharge to the Burdekin River is dominated by spring fed creeks and rivers in the dry season. This is particularly evident along the Basalt River and Fletcher Creek and the Toowoomba Spring Complex, indicated by the red circles, where water is always present. Analysis of groundwater level changes suggests aquifers are unconfined at monitoring bores. Limited long-term monitoring suggests that groundwater levels at some areas are still declining since high rainfall and extensive flooding from December 2010 to January 2011. 
The improved understanding of the key groundwater system processes in each of the McBride and Nullar Basalt provinces achieved through the Exploring for the Future program will lead to responsible water resource management that considers the importance of groundwater dependent ecosystems and a more informed decision making on future water developments. I'll now hand over to my colleague Hashim Carey who will provide some closing remarks. Thank you, Laura. I'm Hashim Carey, and in closing, we'll take a moment to highlight groundwater data sets we've made discoverable and available, summarise the program outcomes and impacts, and acknowledge the invaluable contributions that have advanced the state of groundwater knowledge. An important aspect of our program has been understanding the needs of end users from our data and products. There are a range of outputs pertinent to a variety of stakeholders, from policy makers and water managers to support better decision making to landholders and communities to better understand the water resources available to them. We have made this new data and information freely available to all interested parties. The new Exploring for the Future data portal is a cornerstone for discovering our data as well as accessing data through Geoscience Australia's regular delivery channels. Geoscience Australia ascribes to the FAIR data principles, those being findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. This is reflected in our efforts to develop readily used tools to ensure the equitable discovery and access of our data. An exemplar is the hydrochemistry database and associated web services as are visible in the program portal. These data layers are a compilation of data acquired during Exploring for the Future and legacy data held by Geoscience Australia and its forebears. The portal view presented here are measurements of groundwater sample pH interactively displayed using continentally consistent categorizations. The consistency of data acquired and managed by GA is a fundamental asset to building confidence in our data holdings. Here we see comparable values of the major cation, major anion chloride across four different straight jurisdictions. We lower the effort of data access by applying novel visualizations for water chemistry. Here are locations of water samples color coded to a Piper diamond plot visualization. This method was derived from Luke Peters of the CSIRO in a paper titled, A Background Color Scheme for Piper Plots to Spatially Visualize Hydrochemical Patterns, as published in the Groundwater Journal. These simple visualizations allow for qualitative inferences to be drawn quickly from the data. As presented earlier, Geoscience Australia acquired closely spaced airborne electromagnetic data to support water resource assessments. The example shown here is of the Howard East region. The portal contains intuitive tools to support the discovery and 3D visualization of AEM data. This assists data evaluation prior to time consuming download. Geoscience Australia's expertise in acquiring and quality checking large scale AEM data is transferred to our high density AEM data surveys. Such AEM surveys, such as this view of the Daly River AEM survey, complements and supports traditional hydrogeological investigations. We invite you to browse the portal and discover our AEM surveys along with our other data for yourselves. To summarise, we have provided an overview of activities related to, groundwater to the groundwater component of our EFTF program. Our program in activities are encompassed by three focal themes, namely water for communities, groundwater for economic development, and groundwater for the environment. Our groundwater programs outcomes and impacts include the following. Firstly, an improved understanding of the size and controls of groundwater resources in key areas in northern and central Australia. In partnership with state and territory agencies, Geoscience Australia has delivered new geoscience data sets and information. This work has improved our knowledge of the groundwater resource potential of the following regions of Tennant Creek, Western Davenport, Tea Tree and Alice Springs, the Daly River near Catherine, the Howard East region near Darwin and the Upper Burdekin River catchment inland from Townsville. We have assessed and identified groundwater capture and storage options that enhance water security for communities and economic development. Geoscience Australia has developed a new workflow and a map mapping methodology to identify prospective managed aquifer recharge sites, MAR, 
This has been applied around the Western Davenport in the Northern Territory and provides options towards water supply security for agricultural developments and remote communities. The program has also identified new potential groundwater resources to augment community water supplies and to manage groundwater related risks. We have applied cutting edge investigations to give insight into groundwater resources across the North, providing vital information for the development and management of secure water supplies. Geoscience Australia provided authoritative, independent information and advice to users of environmental resources. We have made available information from robust and innovative scientific tools ranging from airborne platforms to subsurface samples. These include geological and hydrogeological data, borehole and ground-based geophysics, hydrogeochemical surveys, airborne electromagnetics and LIDAR surveys, and remotely sensed data. This information and our interpretation improves the groundwater system understanding in the north. We have delivered baseline hydrogeological data and information in key areas to inform decisions on water management plans and environmental impact assessments. The new data and improved understanding of groundwater systems will increase groundwater security for remote communities, facilitate better water management decisions and help protect environmental and cultural assets. And finally, our work supports water managers better allocate water resources with greater certainty to give subsequent confidence to agricultural investors whilst protecting environmental and cultural values. An improved understanding of groundwater system characteristics will assist resource management and make better informed decisions on groundwater future developments in these regions. To finish, Geoscience Australia would like to thank our project partners and federal and state government counterparts who have contributed and supported us over the course of the Exploring for the Future program. We acknowledge the efforts of individual landholders and traditional owners in facilitating access to data and information. In parting, we draw attention and acknowledge the endurance, dedication and professionalism of Geoscience Australia staff involved throughout the Exploring for the Future program. Thank you for listening. We will now move to questions. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Serkham, and I am the program coordinator for the Exploring for the Future program. And I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to the Q&A session of today's Groundwater Roadshow. I hope you have found the uh, presentation very informative. I have some of our uh, subject matter experts online with us today to answer some of your questions. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Sundaram Baskaran, who is Director of Regional Groundwater, Hash Carey, who is the Acting Director of Groundwater Advice, Stephen Hostetler is a hydrogeologist and activity leader for the Southern Stewart Corridor Project, and KP Tan, who is our uh, specialist uh, geologist in geophysical techniques. Uh, you will see a Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, so you should be able to click on that and uh, type in a question. Uh, and uh, we will endeavour to answer as many of the, those questions as possible in the next 20 minutes, but um, we will, we will uh, follow up on any questions that we don't get to. So to our first question, which I will pass to uh, Steve, is around, uh, I'll read this one out. Um, will there be a specific study and assessment of the paleo channel aquifers covering uh, covered by surveying from Alice Springs to Tennant Creek over and above the tea tree in Western Davenport uh, WCD detailed surveying, um, the Hanson, Boney, Warabri and Pearl Party channels. Um, I'm assuming I've got that right, Stephen. I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Um, yes, and thank you all for um, listening today. We have no specific plans at the moment to look through that, but we have made all the data available um, that we've collected. So we have local AEM data at the project areas and then combined with the Oz AEM. So there's a lot of information out there available for mapping um, paleo channels for folks who um, are interested in that for water for supply, for um, mining purposes, uh, whatever you want to do. And, um, you know, GA has a long history in the Paleo Valley um, space having worked in the Wasnant area where we looked at the Paleo Valleys of uh, West Australia, South Australia and the Northern Territory. And, um, you know, 
come talk to us. We would love to hear more information about um, the world of uh, Paleo Valleys with you. So back to you, Keith. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next question I have, uh, I guess, relates to our, um, our great collaborators at the um, Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, the question is, uh, with the Bureau of Meteorology, um, BOM being responsible for water data nationally, will GA water data collected in the EFTF program be shared or migrated to, to the Bureau of Meteorology? Uh, over to you, Hash. Oh, thanks, Keith. Look, this is a matter that's very much on the forefront of our minds. There is a substantial amount of intricately related data sets that we have collected over the EFTF. And we at GA are committed to making these data sets available via our you know, usual delivery mechanisms and channels. But we will also act, work actively to ensure that our colleagues over at the Bureau of MET um, get the appropriate data migrated into national repositories. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Ash. Uh, next question I will have is for uh, Baskaran. Um, I guess this is to do, and this has come up in the other roadshows as well, is a sort of a generic question about uh, obviously a lot of the work we do, you know, we have to work very closely with our state and territory colleagues and partners and the various government departments that we work with. Uh, I guess there's a question there about, um, you know, how, how how have we worked with those those colleagues and uh, I guess then moving forward is you know how do we see that playing out in the future as well with the uh, with the expanded program so I'll, I'll throw that one to Baskarin over to you uh, thank you Keith uh, that's a very good uh, question and um, as you all know um, the key strength of uh, geoscience Australia is working with our state and territory water agency partners and we have done that in the past, and we are currently doing. And uh, in the case of um, uh, any project we do, we work with them and understand their issues, and we will involve them from the beginning and at the end, uh, and we will travel with them along the journey. And uh, as you all know, uh, based on the successful completion of the uh, Exploring for the Future program, uh, in June 2016, uh, the Australian government announced it will invest an additional $125 million over the next four years to expand the Exploring for the Future program to cover the whole of Australia. In addition to that, uh, I just want to let everyone know that um, uh, Geoscience Australia has outlined our key priorities in a 10-year strategic plan, which is called Strategy 2028. If you haven't heard about it, please visit GA website that will give you our 10-year plan. Our CEO, Dr. James Johnson, he has got a long-term vision. He has clearly outlined what we will be doing for the next 10 years. And we will be focusing on six key impact areas. One of the areas is securing Australia's water resources team. And whatever the work we have done so far and the work what we will be doing through our expansion of the Exploring for the Future program that will feed into our strategy 2028. Thank you, Keith, and back to you. Thank you, Baskarin. Um, and that's a good um pitch actually for tomorrow while I've, I've got the floor is to remind people about the uh, discussion panel uh, which uh, winds up our virtual roadshows and in particular um, James Johnson our CEO will be giving uh, introductory um, presentation to to that um, discussion panel where I think he will he will cover a lot of that sort of strategic agenda um, as well so that'll be well well worth your time tuning in and and, um, and watching that uh, my next question I will uh, bring it up and uh, I will ask uh, KP uh, to answer this one uh, around uh, yeah, basically a very simple question. Are you planning on estimating uncertainties? Over to you KP. Sorry KP, we'll try again. I'm just going to, perhaps we'll come back to KP, have we got it this time? 
Nope, okay, we'll come back to KP. Sorry, a few technical issues at this end. Uh, next question I will uh, address um, back to uh, Stephen is around, sorry, once I, I bring it up here. Um, the question is, uh, in the Western Davenport, so the limiting factor for MAR is surface water um, availability, um, MAR being managed aquifer recharge, uh, not aquifer properties. Uh, do you agree? Over to you, Stephen. Uh, thanks for the question, um, Keith. And of course, it's a mixture of both. You have to understand the nature of the aquifer system um, and the nature of the soils that you're going to pass through, but also, of course, Water, um, water supply, surface water supply is um, an important factor. And um, so I invite you all to um, look at um, two of the reports that have been written. One, um, the Western Devonport Hydrogeologic Assessment um, led by Jessica Northey, and then the Managed Act for Recharge Assessment led by Martin Smith. Both great examples of the work. And I guess the, when we're talking about MAR in Central Australia, we know that large rainfall events really do um, recharge the aquifer, but they're rare. And so when we're talking about managed aquifer recharge, we're saying, okay, those rare, those big events are rare. Can we maybe look at 100 millimeter events and use that to um, recharge the aquifer rather than 150 millimeter events? So rather than something that happens once every 10 years, something happens every once every two years and work through all that. So obviously the um, assessments we made and the things we're talking about are initial stabs at it, but um, I think there's a really great opportunity um, in Central Australia and throughout Australia to use Manage Act for Recharge to help extend the sustainability of the groundwater resource. Keith? Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, next uh, question I will um, pose to uh, to hash is around um, what specific uh, imagery and products and satellite remote sensing do you find useful for your data integration and monitoring of groundwater discharge? Does that include NDVI and other vegetation indices? Uh, over to you, Hash. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, unfortunately, we don't have our groundwater remote sensing specialist, Dr. Laura Gow, with us here today, um, so I'll attempt to answer this as best as I can. Um, we do use imagery from our Digital Earth Australia colleagues and their data set um, within the building and we integrate the expertise we have here at Geoscience Australia as part of our multidisciplinary efforts um, to monitor groundwater discharge and surface groundwater interactions. Um, these include tools as the ones that you've mentioned but as well as our water observations for space and tassel cap wetness indices. Um, and we're always expanding our techniques and toolkit to, in future to inc also incorporate satellite data such as um, satellite radar, INSAR uh, interferometric synthetic aperture radar, and um, our GRACE data sets. If you'd like to know more, please get in touch with us and maybe we can connect you with um, Laura Jow. Thank you. Thank you, Hash. Um, we'll try KP again. And so the, uh, the question I had was, uh, are you planning on estimating uncertainties? So I'll throw it to you, KP, and see if it works this time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, yep. So yes, uh, we are planning to um, estimate the uncertainties uh, in terms of the uh, electrical conductivity and the uh, depth associated with it. And uh, the as part of the AEM data release uh, accompanying report, um, you can find the the estimates uh, in there as well, and all the uh, technical parameters um, associated with the uh, AEM. Uh, survey design and uh, inversion. Yep. Thanks. Back to you, Keith. Thanks, KP. Uh, next question I will uh, pass to um, Baskaran. Uh, is there more work scheduled for the Nulla and McBride basalt provinces with regard to springs and aquifers? Is the work complete in that region? Uh, over to you, Baskaran. Um, thank you very much, uh, Keith, uh, for the question. And uh, as you know, uh, Geoscience Australia has used uh, uh, multidisciplinary uh, geoscience tools, including satellite measurements to understand the, the basalt and uh, Nala, um, Nala and McBride uh, basalt uh, aquifer systems. Uh, the work, whatever we have completed now, is really providing the, uh, the fundamental knowledge gap they had on hydrogeological understanding 
which we have provided and the information generated in terms of understanding the uh, the springs understanding the um, the groundwater levels groundwater quality uh, recharge and the groundwater flow dynamics all these information we have packaged into a hydrogeological system understanding that will be useful for uh, the Queensland government is currently thinking of developing a new water management plan and this hydrogeological information uh, generated by the exploring for the future program will feed into that will improve their understanding of both groundwater and surface water having said that um, as part of this study, we have identified uh, some knowledge gaps to uh, get some long-term monitoring of groundwater level data in a strategic locations, which we have passed in, into the report. Hopefully, the, our Queensland Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy uh, colleagues will look at that and um, uh, do some feature work to understand better so that they can manage these resources better in the upper Burdekin region of Queensland. Thank you, Keith. I will pass it to you. Thank you, Baskarin. Uh, next question, uh, I'll pass uh, to KP again as well. Um, so the question, again, a fairly uh, straightforward one, hopefully, is uh, what are the depth and resolution limits for, uh, I guess it's uh, airborne electromagnetic, yeah, sorry, airborne electromagnetic data? Uh, over to you, KP. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Keith. The uh, depth of investigation for the AEM uh, maximum is uh, 400 meters, and it depends on the electrical conductivity uh, vertical structure or profile. If we have um, near surface electrical conductivity, um, the depth of investigation will be um, shallower, uh, down to about 100 or 200 meters. Um, and the the uh, the footprint of the AEM um, increases with depth. So at a shallow uh, depth less than 100 meters, uh, we can resolve about 10 to 20 meters um, uh, depth slice uh, grids very well. And then uh, as we go further deeper, um, the resolution will increase to about 40 or 50 meters uh, depth intervals. Uh, back to you, Keith. Uh, thank you, KP. Um, just looking through the questions here. So, just sort of a, a another sort of generic question. I guess we've got several several questions around. Is uh, I guess around the the general skills that are required to use this data. You know, how do we go about accessing the data? Well, not so much accessing, but actually using the data and applying it to our needs. Um, I think that's probably a, an interesting sort of general question because it sort of um, relates very much to GA's overall role in sort of encouraging the adoption of new data and new methods. So um, with that sort of context in mind, Basker, and do you want to comment a bit further about where you see the general skills that are needed to use the data that we've generated? I'll pass that to you. Over. Um, thank you, Keith. Uh, that's, um, that's a very good question um, in terms of, um, yes, we are we have collected um, a range of uh, geoscience uh, data sets um, uh, geoscience australia uh, will uh, work with uh, state and territory colleagues in terms of um, using this data for uh, making uh, better decisions whether it is a water management plan or developing any new areas for uh, groundwater development uh, we will be working with them and uh, as part of that um, uh, we will be uh, not only uh, working with the state and territory colleagues, but also the data sets will be released through uh, the Exploring for the Future a new portal that has been developed so anyone can access the data sets for uh, whether you are a, a researcher or you are a community or you are from a manager, everyone can access the data sets. And that's where uh, the key strength of geoscience is that we work with a range of stakeholders and we, we provide some training as well in terms of using these data sets for making a better decisions. That's the one approach. We are really keen to uh, work with the uh, uh, various stakeholders to make sure uh, the data sets, whatever we have collected, has been used for 
a range of purposes, uh, whether it is a catchment or a basin for their working. Thank you, Keith. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Baskaran. Uh, we've got uh, another question that's come in here, so I'll I'll pass this one back to um, KP again. Uh, are there quantitative assessments of the volume of groundwater in their respective study areas? So I'll perhaps start with KP, but perhaps some of the other um, activity leads might want to comment on their, their areas as well. So um, over to you, KP. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, we haven't um, calculated any of the uh, you know, quantitative uh, volume uh, of uh, groundwater resources. However, we have uh, mapped the isocore of the aquifers and we have also um, collected the um, the porosity or the effective porosity uh, based on the magnetic resonance uh, geophysical tools and this can be used to um, give it a quantitative assessment of the groundwater resource um, in the in the study area yep. back to you Keith uh, thank you KP um, I'll just give a Look around to see if there's any of the others that want to comment on their areas in particular. No, that's good. Okay, so I think uh, we're sort of approaching time here, so I'll uh, I'll wrap things up. So thank you everyone for um, being involved today. Yes, we'll um, we'll reach out. There's a few more detailed questions in there that uh, are probably quite specialised, so we'll um, uh, reach out to those people in particular. So thank you everyone for your questions. Um, so yes, thanks. Um, for all the panelists um, here today, all the you know, specialists, I should say, for being part of this. This has been a, a great event, and I hope it's been an interesting insight to um, everyone about the great groundwater potential in northern Australia, and particularly the data and tools that are now available to support um, communities and industry um, go about their go about their work and um, and lives. So, um, and I hope you've been able to take away some key information that will that will help you with your work. Um, and if you haven't already, please register for the uh, the final part of the um, EFTF roadshows, which is happening tomorrow, which is the discussion panel um, hosted um, um, by Andrew Heap, uh, Chief of Division for the Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division here at Geoscience Australia. Um, we will look at the next steps that uh, we'll be taking about building a better picture of uh, Australia's minerals, energy and groundwater resources right across the whole nation, which is a, a very exciting um, step for us all. And you should be able to see a registration link at the uh, the, um, in your browser window as well. So I'll, I'll call it a day there. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And from all of us here at Geoscience Australia, have a good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>